having some issues uh, but i can see you all and very clearly hear you uh, so we will begin now in fact uh, are, if you all permit then uh, we will start and go live uh, and and i've shared the uh, you know the schedule as well so it's miss jamie who's going to speak first and then after that we will have uh, dr pratapi ma'am and we time permitting we will also have the questions in the end i have shared uh, we usually take two or three and uh, unless there is something which is coming on youtube so if that's all right and uh, another suggestion is that once uh, we have our introductions and then the speaker who is speaking can keep the video on uh, otherwise and the rest can keep their uh, videos as well off to save on bandwidth so uh, so all set and uh, we are good to go i think I, all good yes yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Namaste. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning. Namaste. On behalf of Central Zoo Authority and Sri Chamarajendra Zoological Gardens, I extend a warm welcome to all our listener participants. This is the eighth in the series of webinars we have initiated to reach out to the zoo community on topics that are of mutual interest and also to bring to you global experts who are well known and respected in this field. Today, through this digital platform, we bring to you some very esteemed speakers to discuss and develop on the aspect of capacity building opportunities for ex situ conservation. At the onset, I would like to welcome Dr. S. P. Yadav, IFS, the ADG Project Tiger and Member Secretary, National Tiger Conservation Authority, and also Central Zoo Authority. Dr. Yadav is an Indian Forest Service officer with a distinguished career in wildlife management. He has been instrumental in bringing policy reforms for global tiger conservation, and of course now with Central Zoo Authority as well, where he facilitated the role of seized zoos from uh, the regulatory phase to the new facilitation phase. So, sir, I would request you to give your opening remarks and on also on the concept for this particular session. Thank you, Sonali, and a very good afternoon to our subject matter experts and all participants. Um, and thank you, Sonali, for organizing a series of webinars. In fact, uh, they have been quite informative and very, very useful. We have been able to get experts from across the world. So I'll begin my presentation by uh, Speaking a little bit on the role of CZA, Central Zoo Authority was created in 1992. And unlike other countries, here in India, no zoo can be established, and no zoo can operate unless it is recognized and approved by the Central Zoo Authority. So that is the difference between India and other countries. And CZA basically is a regulatory body under the Wildlife Protection Act of India. And uh, we, uh, when we say regulation, means we prescribe minimum standards for the zoo, how the zoo has to run, what will be uh, the minimum area for enclosures, animal welfare, designs, animal exchange, and so on. Basically, all aspects of zoo management, they are regulated by the Central Zoo Authority through advisories by issuing rules and guidelines. In this way, we control the zoo management in the India. When you talk of zoo, zoo not only keeping captive animals in enclosures, but it also includes, includes uh, rescue centers and also the circus. Wherever the animals are exhibited, they become part of, they, they are known as a zoo and recognition of Central Zoo Authority is required. It's a basically regulatory, but now we are changing our role to in a facilitating mode. We are providing technical assistance, guidance, also financial support to Indian zoos. We are also a member of World Association of Zoos and Aquariums that is known as WAZA. Next slide, please. So, the main functions of CZA, as you can see on the screen, is to create a legal framework through policy level decisions to regulate and facilitate zoo management. Ex situ conservation of threatened Indian wildlife. This is again a very, very important aspect. Like many species are threatened and highly endangered. And the only possibility, only scope which 
we are looking at to breed them ex situ in breeding uh, in zoos and then after rewilding them we can release them in the wild there are certain successful examples in india and uh, we are looking for other species also promoting conservation awareness and outreach for which uh, bitapi madam is here today uh, outreach and awareness that is one of the most important aspect of zoo management because not all our people who are interested in wildlife can visit or can afford to visit our national parks sanctuaries and tiger reserves so zoo provides a uh, easy access and especially for kids and aged people or handicap uh, handicap uh, persons disabled persons they can also visit and enjoy the wild animals in urban settings so awareness and outreach about species conservation about wildlife management and that is one of the most important aspect of zoo management in india uh, approximately 7 to 8 million people they visit our zoos on annual basis this covid situation is a difficult situation where all zoos are shut down but uh, i hope this situation will soon be over developing science based protocols for captive management of anim uh, wild animals in indian zoos that is uh, again the role of the zoo with the help of wildlife institute of india iwri and all such institutions we are driving, uh, developing protocols for captive management grooming indian zoos as prime a uh, premium ex situ facilities with established linkages in in situ conservation i have already spoken about it and then capacity building professional animal management practices through technical cooperation again this is very very important aspect capacity as i said there are more than uh, i think 10 to 20000 people working in indian zoos and uh, capacity is very very important extremely important uh, aspect of zoo management and i feel that there is a tremendous scope and not much is being done uh, we are not able to do as much as what is what is needed in the field next slide please there are uh, 100 approximately 152 zoo and uh, they, they as you can see on the map they are evenly spread across all uh, different parts of the country next slide please as i said this human resource development and capacity building is very important aspect when cjd is playing an important role in this webinar is also a part of that bringing uh, experts from globe across the globe uh, and uh, making their thoughts and presentations available to our zoo managers and cjd is playing an important role in this uh, capacity building we try to organize five regional and one national training but, but as i said if you look at the number large number of zoo keepers curators biologists Uh, veterinary officers this capacity building what we are doing uh, right now to me it looks like uh, much has to be done next slide we are also trying for international cooperation uh, with national and international experts zoo institutions like we had one mou with the smithsonian for capacity building of indian uh, veterinary practitioners which are who are posted in zoos and the uh, Uh, unfortunately it got discontinued but now we are trying to revive it series of webinars like this we have we are uh, organizing during this covid pandemic and also another good thing which is possible by uh, working experience king in different zoos like exchange of officers and uh, to national and international zoos that we are working on we are planning for that in fact we are preparing a vision plan for next 10 years for india or indian zoos and uh, we are also envisaging upgrading the standard of 10 zoos to the global level so in this way we will include this capacity building exchange of officers all these things in our vision plan and will uh, strive to implement all these new ideas in next future uh, thank you very much for the experts for joining this webinar and i am looking forward for your presentation i hope that 
all participants our zoom managers they will be benefited out of it thank you very much thank you very much sir uh, capacity building is as you have rightly said strong on the agenda of cza day and we are trying to take that forward in every possible front and platform so uh, for that now i invite our next speaker which is mr jamie copsy the director of training iucn uh, uh, species specialist group cpsg jamie has more than 20 years of experience in capacity building he has worked with the daral wildlife conservation trust and since 2017 he has been the director of training for iucn conservation planning specialist group uh, with the remit to help the organization for building the global capacity for species conservation planning he is currently organizing the first online conservation planning toolkit course for mid career professionals from across the globe and i'm happy to be part of that jamie as well as i'm attending that over to you thank you thank you and uh, sonali can i share my own screen and then um, advance the slides is that yes, you please. Okay? that's fine okay yes, that's fine. all right so uh, thank you for your um your your scene setting presentation um and uh, two words that came up or two terms that came up in your presentation that resonate with this talk are facilitation and capacity building and um as sonali um it, uh, it explained i work for the conservation planning specialist group of the species survival commission and this group was originally set up 40 years ago or so um, to be the liaison between the zoo community and, um, and, and the rest of the conservation, the species conservation community. Since that time, we've gone through a number of um, name changes and evolutions and to arrive at where we are now, where we look at how can we help and we support any organisations that are concerned about species and who want to develop plans to conserve those threatened species um, to design the processes that bring people together, uh, bring information together, encourage discussion, encourage evaluation, encourage critical review um, to end up with a collaborative species conservation plan. And so facilitation is very much uh, a part of what we, what we do. And in this short presentation, I'd like to take you through some core principles of planning for species conservation, which, which we feel very strongly um, should underpin whatever process one uses. Uh, and, I, and hopefully they will resonate with you. And I'll be interested to hear your thoughts afterwards because we've not done this presentation much. We've only recently actually consolidated around these seven particular principles, although they have kind of been embedded in our, in our hearts and souls for the last 40 years. So um, just to give a bit of context, uh, we all work, uh, whether in zoos or in, in field conservation, if we're in species, involved in species conservation, we work in a very complex space. Um, now this complexity is based on these, these two axes. And if you look at the, on the, up, up the side, on the left-hand side and along the bottom, and these relate to the de degree of agreement that exists around courses of action that should be taken about what's right to do, what's not, or what people care about or, or what they don't. And um, along the bottom, around the levels of certainty we have around the, um, down the output of any particular actions. So for some, um, there, there will be people, and I'm sure many of you have come across them, who will say, you know, that, that, that having animals from captivity, they shouldn't go back to the wild. And obviously people from within the zoo community recognize the value that those individuals can play um, when done properly in species conservation. And so you end up with this disagreement around what should be done or what is, you know, what, what is, what is uh, um, um, okay to do, what is possible to do and what is not. And so this is, this is a messy area um, where we have lots of different views on what the right course of action is. And then along the bottom, one might say, um, what will be the impact of putting those animals back in the wild or what would be the impact of bringing animals into captivity or breeding them in captivity now we can we can make forecasts of what we think will happen with the population um, but we don't know for sure uh, it, there there are too many unknowns 
So we have low levels of certainty and we have um, high levels often um, of disagreement around what the course of action should be. So we, we operate in this complex space and arguably, actually, at the moment, we might you might say we live in an anarchic space, a kind of chaotic area, particularly with COVID, as we, we really do not know what's going to happen. But we still need to work within this space. And this is the space that CPSG inhabit. So we, we help bring together different sorts of organizations um, to, 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 to pull what they know, what they think they know, what they care about, uh, to, ident to, to reach agreement around um, what's the best way forward. And we have increasing evidence that this sort of collaborative approach to species conservation works. The Tasmanian devil is one, one species, but there are many others uh, closer to home in India, uh, as well as um, further afield, where um, the species are either stabilized in the wild or they're increasing. And, and one can track back to um, a catalytic role of the, the, the workshop where people were brought together to develop the plan in the first place. We, we have seven principles that we feel should underpin whatever approach you take to species conservation planning. These may, may seem just blatantly obvious. You're planning to act. And none of us are interested in designing plans that sit on shelves. And there are too many plans that sit on shelves or keep doors open um, uh, around the world. Um, and so the however you design the process, uh, it, we feel it is critical that you, you keep that goal in mind and therefore design the process to fit, uh, to be fit for purpose. What this means is that there is no single right way of doing conservation planning. There's not a cut and paste where you say you can get groups to do this, now get them to use this tool, now get them to ask this question, and then you produce the plan at the end. Uh, you need to tailor the process to suit the audience and that that and, and the context and that makes it more complex because it's not a, a, a following a recipe um, that produces a lovely cake which in this case is the an, an implemented species conservation plan um, you may need to change what you're thinking of doing in order to get the best out of people enable them to reach consensus the second principle is around the 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 need for inclusion for participation in the planning process so we would say that everybody who has relevant knowledge, who is um, ha could have an impact on your project or who will be impacted by your project, all those affected should be involved in the decision making process around the plan. There are rarely situations where one person can produce a plan on in their office um, and have all the power and ability, the resources to implement that plan. They rely on other organizations, they rely on other people to do things or do things differently in order for that plan to work. And therefore, for people to buy into the plan, for people to be excited by and believe uh, and to own the plan, then they need to be part of that process. And this can be challenging and definitely makes it more complex because you have lots of different views that you're having to take into account and different perspectives on, on what's the right thing to do is. Uh, and this, it's not just about include, um, including wide groups of people, but also thinking about how their voices are heard. In this case, the reason for this um, uh, sand tiger shark being up there is that uh, currently, actually, in Brazil, we're involved in helping to develop a species conservation plan for this species across several countries. And a critical audience who should be involved in that planning are the fishers themselves who catch these sharks. Putting, because of COVID, we have to have the workshop as a virtual workshop, and it was felt that the, 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 this group would not be interested, not want to engage in this virtual environment. And therefore, other ways were found to include their voices. So there were pre-workshop surveys, there, were, there was an app for their phones, and we asked them to um, record uh, to camera a video of themselves talking about what they care about, what they think is important, what should what they know about the species, so that this information could be incorporated into the planning process. So it's about inclusion and also how people's voices are heard and valued. The third principle is the basis or the information base on which we, we, we encourage people to, to build plans. 
And that involves gathering together the best available information. And it may take time to do this, particularly as often, and you will find this within your, within your zoo context, much of the information um, on the species, what is known about it, doesn't reside in bits of paper or documents. It resides in people's heads. And so trying to gather the information is a process, it's a social process of encouraging people to share what they know, what they think they know, and therefore being able to create these ingredients, this sort of soup of information on which um, plans can be built. And we often use, we, we go one step further in many workshops, though not all, and we use something called population viability analyses, where, the, where you, there's a, a, a computer modeling program that will gather together the information that you have and give you some sense of what is likely to happen to the population over time, whether it's going to decline to extinction, whether you can, through dimensions, move that line so it's going up, or will it be stable? And so it's a, it's a, it, it, it enables us to predict what the impact of different conservation interventions might be um, for, this, for this species. We're actually looking at this at the moment for a, um, a species of, uh, of, uh, of marine turtle um, and thinking about what would be the impact of different um, um, amounts of head starting and translocation on the wild population to see whether or not we can we could imagine in the next 20 to 50 years the population could increase partly supported by these um, these ex situ interventions so that third um, principle around on science the fourth is where is is where we spend much of our time and that is working helping groups to work out what it is they want to achieve and then it's our job or anyone's job who's the facilitator of that process to design the process and think about what steps would be worth going through in order to help groups to reach a decision and a, an additional aspect to this is neutrality that that um, it, it's necessary um, for the person who's facilitating the process to not have a vested interest in the outcome where where they do participants can perceive that there might be some bias and that they're trying to encourage decisions to go in one direction or another so neutrality in the facilitation of these processes is critical to success for, for people to actually buy into the plan in the end through good design and through neutral facilitation and gathering together the information and the people um, the process is designed to help groups to reach consensus and that doesn't mean making sure that everybody feels 100% happy and excited about the outcome, although that's wonderful when it happens. But it is ensuring that everybody can be galvanized around a particular course of action. They may not love it, but if, the, if they've had a chance to express different views and look at alternative ones, see what the most likely um, best options will be, then there's a there's a higher chance than these people can buy into the plan and and at least agree that this is the right way forward. And if we can get agreement, then there's a much higher chance that that plan is not going to sit on the shelf, that that plan will be implemented and everybody in the plan will do what they need to do. Moving towards the uh, end of the principles, um, there's uh, principle six is around the generation and sharing of products quickly. And a good illustration of this was uh, uh, in, uh, back in March, April, um, before the lockdown, um, when we, in fact, it was February, um, when we went to the, the Azores in, in um, the group of islands of, of um, Portugal um, to help develop a, a plan, a multi species plan for invertebrates for a group of snails that were there. And at the end of the workshop, because we often will get the draft workshop plan produced at the end of the workshop, not later on, but it, it, it actually is, it's, 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 it's fi not finalized, but is drafted um, before everybody leaves. We were able to share the results with a group of politicians, one of whom happened to be traveling around the group of islands and wanted to have good things to talk about. And they latched on to this, um, the results of this workshop and publicly proclaimed that they were going to support this plan. Uh, they were going to go for um, uh, European Union funding for it. Um, and within 24 hours of the plan being being produced and drafted, um, there was there was a, a high level commitment 
to um, supporting it. And they're now looking for EU, uh, applying for EU funding. They've also started to reorientate to the protected area um, so that it, it captures the main habitats for these species. And this came from just by chance, really, just by sharing, getting the information out, getting the plan out to other groups who might have um, an influence over the success of that particular species conservation plan. And finally, coming back to where we are now, really, is the, the, the principle of adapting to changing circumstances. And this is both in terms of the plan itself, that we should help groups to develop plans that both include monitoring, but also opportunities to change the direction of the plan as new information arises and opportunities arise so that you can, you can take advantage um, of, of this, this very dynamic environment in which we live. And it also relates to the planning process itself. So historically, i.e. before March this year, um, we would almost always develop, we would run multi-stakeholder workshops where everybody was physically brought together um, to develop the plan. But since COVID, we've had to adapt very quickly and now looking to, to have multi-species and multi-stakeholder um, planning processes happening remotely so that we can still get on and do the work that we need to do um, but um, but we, we're dealing with both new opportunities with technology, but also with um, with things like these uh, these sorts of diseases that are around. And plan to act, promote inclusive participation, use sound science, ensure good design and neutral facilitation, decisions through consensus, generate and share products quickly, and adapt to changing circumstances. Underpin everything we do. And this, to the end of the talk, um, uh, ties is, is captured within the training that we have available. Now, our training is very much embedded within the one plan approach, which would consider that all individuals of a species, whether they are in wild or in captivity, should in the first place be on the table. You should think about them as, a, as a, in their entirety, the population in its entirety. Uh, and then decide whether or not it's appropriate, useful to have the ex situ involved in the in situ. And often there are real opportunities that come from that. So the training we offer is around species conservation planning, the sorts of processes that I've been, um, or principles, and putting them into practice that I've been talking about. And we run that both online, and that's what um, Sonali's um, following at the moment, and also in person. There's more sort of general courses around facilitation and communication. The IUCN ex situ guidelines uh, is, um, is, a, is a resource that I would recommend you, you familiarize yourselves with. Um, and we run training in, in the application of those guidelines in person and are currently developing um, the, 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 the course online, probably be available next year. Disease risk analysis, again, available in person and online, and training trainers in these particular processes. So as well as this training, so a resource that you can go to straight after this webinar, you can have a look at the CPSG website and there's a section there that will say document library. You'll look at, you can look at plans that have been produced for species that you might be, might be care about. Um, there's also a webinar series there, which you can um, tap into and, and, uh, and, and hear more about topics related to species conservation planning that are freely available. In the top left, there's a facilitator's guide to species conservation planning, which you can download from our website. website. There are IUCN guidelines on wildlife disease risk analysis and the application of the ex situ guidelines. The most, most recently, and it's not yet published, but will be shortly, the species conservation planning principles and steps, which is what I've been referring to this time. And then there's also resources there to do with how you might plan for um, these sorts of processes online. And this was actually first done when our name was the Conservation Breeding Specialist Group. So with that, uh, I'd like to draw it to a close. Um, thank you. And I, I think we're gonna take questions and comments at the end. Right, um, thank you so much, uh, the, uh, Mr. Jamie. That was amazingly good. And I'm, uh, I mean, my apologies that we've not given you enough time because there is a dearth of repository which is available on the CPSG website and it's fairly well updated. So thank you so much. And we'll take questions later on. So I will now uh, request the second speaker.
This is Dr. Vedapi Sinha. Uh, she is a senior scientist at WII and a teacher to many, including me. So Dr. Bhitapi has more than 27 years of experience in native interpretation, conservation education, and wildlife tourism. And as part of WI project, she has supervised nature interpretive, uh, interpretive uh, facilities in India, Bangladesh, and several other countries. And uh, she was instrumental in conducting the certificate course in native interpretation uh, for zoo guide training, uh, which was under the MOEFCC Green Skill Development Program. Uh, just before the pandemic happened in 2019. So, ma'am, over to you uh, and uh, with a request for your presentation. Uh, madam, please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Sonali. Thank you, Dr. Sonali, for the... Um... India definitely always uh... Madam, uh, you can turn off your video perhaps. Uh, there is an issue with your bandwidth. Uh, maybe you can turn off your video and just share the slides. Okay. Is that better now? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay, wonderful. So I'll just start with a small little video. As Jamie mentioned, um, uh, things are complicated. Uh, it's not only complicated, it is also complex. And in the zoo scenario, it is even more complex. And uh, uh, because the nature is complex, uh, it is very, very important for us to understand uh, uh, how nature works, how uh, species, how habitats, how ecosystems work. And that uh, uh, that is uh, oh, the reason that we need capacity development. 
there's been a paradigm shift uh, as far as the zoos are concerned. The conservation messages are shifting from uh, captive breeding to uh, to saving environment and, and habitat. Zoos are now undertaking breeding programs for the release in the wild. And there's also a mindset change of the visitors uh, who come to the zoo for uh, zoo and about zoos as well as about conservation. Thanks to the media explosion, a lot of media is covering uh, information on environment, information on animal, information on habitats, because of which the, even the, the mindset of the visitors to the zoo is now changing. Why do we need capacity building? We need capacity building because scientific knowledge is every day changing. There is, there is an, uh, a rise in research, there's a, uh, is a rise in uh, technology, there is a rise in science. And because of that, uh, uh, the connectivity to the life system and uh, habitat has also greatly increased. And there's no dearth of scientific knowledge. There is uh, lots of scientific knowledge. But how much of this scientific knowledge actually percolates down to our frontline staff, which is very, very important. And if it does, then how does it uh, percolate to them? We need to we need to see that. The other is there is increasing um, evidence that conservation is not only a matter of saving the species or the habitat, but it needs cooperation uh, both at the national as well as a global approach, which means uh, uh, the manpower needs to be trained. They needs to be they need to be updated about uh, the technology. They need to be updated about the conservation issues going around. Also, the importance of capacity building is now widely being recognized. People are now seeing the importance of because of the rise in uh, technology, because of the amount of information available, people are now also seeing the importance of capacity building. Uh, providing uh, zoo professionals with the skills in the, uh, in, for them to develop and disseminate information in an effective manner. Um, the local information in an effective manner uh, is the reason why we need capacity building and also increase the knowledge and the skills and the expertise um, that is there within the zoo personnel for them to uh, to also transmit this information uh, to other others, uh, uh, visitors, students, um, uh, the community as a large uh, in large is why uh, capacity building is required. In uh, zoos, uh, currently um, the staff is th is the focal point, but the staff does a lot of activities. These are some of the activities that I've just listed. If I start listing each and every activity that a, that the staff do in a zoo, then the whole the slide will be covered with dots and. Because of the multitude of activities that the staff uh, do on a daily basis, uh, uh, it is very, very important for them to be kept, to be abreast with the knowledge, to be abreast with the technology, to be, uh, to keep, uh, keep their motivation level uh, high. Uh, and training is one, one thing that keeps uh, the staff motivation high. It encourages just them to perform better. It encourages them uh, to uh, go a step ahead of uh, others and to uh, to achieve certain targets. Now, if we do a SWOT analysis of the current activities that um, that are happening in the zoo, zoos have live animals, which is a great strength. There is a large footfall, uh, uh, seven to eight million visitors, which Dr. Yadav mentioned uh, in the in the 152 zoos that we have in the country. We have dedicated manpower. That is a is a great strength for the zoos. We have animal breeding programs, we undertake research, and we also do conservation education. But along with the strengths, there are also certain uh, weaknesses that we have. Skills do not get transferred uh, at all levels. So the skill transfer is an issue within the zoo. Uh, there, there, are no, uh, there are few structured programs, but not many structured training programs. There are training programs, but they are not very structured training programs. Uh, motivation also to a certain extent, um, and also evaluation and monitoring. Now, the opportunities that we have is really large. Um, we have the opportunity of forging a new identity and a purpose for setting up of a zoo. There, is, uh, there are evolving higher standards. There are better housing and exhibits. Now, 10 zoos have, are 
there is a vision plan which is being made for the 10 uh, zoos, upgrading the 10 zoos. Uh, enhanced animal welfare. There is a lot of networking opportunities. Uh, for example, IUC and SSC group from uh, Jamie just spoke about. Uh, there are n number of uh, networking, both national as well as international uh, opportunities which are available. Uh, the audience are captive. Uh, once they enter the uh, premises of the zoo, they are captive audience. And also there's a great opportunity of zoo beyond the boundary. In um, today's scenario, when we cannot have visitors enter the zoo, at least we can reach out to uh, the people outside the zoo. That is, we can uh, do an outreach program. So there are a lot of opportunity for outreach programs. But one of the major threats that I perceive is financial stability for the zoos. Uh, financial stability is both in terms of uh, managing the zoos and other is also very, very important for training uh, the zoo staff. Um, now, of course, uh, because of the COVID, we, we can uh, definitely do online training programs, which are very, very, which do not need any cost. And uh, um, but otherwise, financial stability is a threat. What does training do? Training actually um, uh, in, uh, strengthens uh, people's uh, perception. Training uh, helps you to uh, understand um, certain uh, elements. Training uh, um, helps you to uh, motivates you to perform better. So um, that these basic uh, things that the training does. Now, who should we train? Uh, one is the zookeepers, uh, like uh, Dr. Yadav also mentioned. Uh, for the, it is very, very important that we train the zookeepers. Uh, they are the, the first uh, line of our uh, zoo, uh, zoo personnel, and they, they are the ones who should be trained because their, uh, their, uh, their performance is uh, linked to our animal welfare. Uh, but what, is, what should be the focus of the training for the zookeepers? It should be on the personal attitude. What is their personal attitude? How do how can they improve their personal attitude? What uh, special uh, things that they can be trained about? And what is the management uh, competencies? So these are the fo focus for the training of uh, the zookeepers. I've listed a large number of basics on which the zookeepers uh, can be trained from animal welfare to behavioral entry to animal environmental enrichment, diet, nutrition, Sample collection for disease investigation and most important communication skill. Zookeeper talks uh, are now uh, widely being uh, used all over the world uh, in the zoos. And uh, in India too, there are some zoos which are already using the zookeeper, zookeepers for talking to the audience, talking to the visitors. So communication skill is one, one um, aspect in which the zookeepers definitely need to be trained in a better way. And who can do, uh, do these trainings? Uh, the Central Zoo Authority in um, a collaboration with the zoos across the country um, can do this and wildlife institute of india can also help uh, in the zookeepers training program already there is the one week training program that happens for the zookeepers but these training programs have to be more organized and more systematic and more specific we have the zoo supervisors uh, or the middle level the zoo curators the middle level uh, um personal in the zoos um for, for whom uh, the leadership competency is very very important uh, if you have a good leader uh, to lead you from the front then um the performance of uh, the manpower or the staff or the zookeepers would be really um, effective and uh, zoo keep, for zookeepers it is uh, for zoo supervisors it is important that uh, they be trained in animal record keeping um, in uh, enclosure designing, in disaster management, visitor studies, regulations and related legislations. We already have a two week uh, training program in the five regions um, uh, in, of the country. Uh, so we, uh, there are five training programs that take place for the middle level supervisors. Um, this, uh, the Central Zoo Authority conducts in collaboration uh, with the Wildlife Institute of India and the zoos, uh, participating zoos. So um, the other is the zoo educators. Um, 
initially the zoo educators program uh, was uh, conducted by the central zoo authority but of lately the zoo educators have been merged with the zoo supervisor training program the reason is we have very few zoo educators in the zoos and that is the reason that the zoo educators um, uh, specific program is uh, now being merged with the uh, the zoo supervisors. Uh, I would like to emphasize for the Central Zoo Authority specifically, uh, Dr. Yadav and Dr. Sonali to uh, do uh, the zoo educators program as a as a separate program altogether because the zoo uh, uh, the visitors to the zoo seven to eight million visitors to the zoo is a very very important uh, uh, component and visitor management is very very important. Uh, it helps us uh, in, in eliciting public support um, uh, for conservation issues. And uh, they, they are very, very important for them, uh, the, uh, especially the visitor studies uh, on who is coming to the zoo, why are they coming to the zoo, what would they like to see in the zoo, and what would they like to do in the zoo, what is their feedback about the, the exhibits that are there in the zoo. Identifying uh, themes, uh, conducting informal and formal programs and identifying themes for the formal and informal programs, uh, developing a message media matrix as to what message can be conveyed through which media, what goes into publication, what goes into newspaper, what goes on, on a signage and what goes in a film communicating communication techniques, what are the self-guided communication techniques and what are the non-guided communication techniques. Uh, also outreach, uh, that is reaching out to the people. What are the techniques for outreach? So these are some of the uh, aspects that the zoo educators can be trained in. Uh, the Central Zoo Authority in collaboration with the Center for Environment Education and the Wildlife Institute of India um, uh, can conduct these training programs. It has been doing, uh, we already have been doing these programs and uh, we can again uh, restart these training programs. For the zoo veterinarians, uh, very, very important um, uh, stakeholders for training programs. And uh, for the zoo veterinarians, again, uh, there are a large number of uh, basics that have, uh, that has been, some basics have been listed, like the breeding program, the an protocol on safety and animal care, animal restraint and transportation, dealing with disease outbreak, um, for example, now with COVID, SARS and COVID, uh, sample collection and preservation, uh, all these um, aspects are some of the aspects that we can train the veterinarians in. And uh, Central Zoo Authority uh, um, can, in collaboration with LICONS, in collaboration with the uh, with IVRI Aizatnagar, and in collaboration with the Wildlife Institute of India, can conduct these training programs. Um, the, uh, of course, um, in times of COVID, we can do we can do the basic theoretical uh, programs online, but the hands-on and the demonstration programs we we can do it uh, whenever um, things uh, are improve in the country. Uh, one of the very important aspects is the zoo guides, and as uh, Dr. Sonali mentioned, under the Green Skill Development Program of the Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. Uh, we uh, conducted one um, uh, such program for zoo guides. Uh, this is uh, giving them and uh, giving the community living around the uh, educated uh, youths living around the uh, zoos uh, uh, opportunity to work for the zoo. And uh, we um, train them as nature guides. And uh, these uh, guides, when they they come, they are ambassadors of goodwill when they go out to the community. They speak highly about uh, the zoos. Our experience with the first green skill development program that we had last year was amazing. And uh, we every day we get information from the participants of their achievements that they have been doing. Uh, some of them are really doing well in the, in the Ahmedabad Zoo. Uh, in the Sayaji Bagh Zoo, uh, they they are uh, really doing amazing work. They are handling uh, the visitors. They are talking to the visitors. They are explaining the visitors. And now they say that the visitors come back with questions to them. They are handling school groups who come uh, on visits to the zoos, and uh, they 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 are now um, much in demand in these zoos. 
So for them, the communication skills uh, to uh, knowledge about the species, knowledge about the habitats, the mandate of the zoo, first aid, very, very important because when there is so much of crowd, uh, if there is any uh, emergency, then it can be taken care of. Visitor management and vandalism. Of, uh, vandalism is something that uh, all the zoos face, uh, not only within the country, but even otherwise um, uh, all over the world. So this is also something that the zoo guides are trained to take care of. And the Central Zoo Authority with the Wildlife Institute of India and the Green Skill Development Program, uh, we can um, undertake this uh, training program in which uh, the young youths uh, can, um, uh, can be trained uh, to become zoo guides. They can volunteer, they can come and work um, in times of needs when there is a lot of crowd, when the, the it's not always that there are visitors, lot of visitors in the zoos. There are times when there are a lot of visitors in the zoos, especially on holidays, uh, uh, during festiv festivals or uh, during winters, um, summers because of extreme heat, not many visitors come to the zoo. So uh, uh, the trains, uh, the um, times when there are a lot of uh, visitors in the zoo, these young youths can be of uh, great help to the zoo management. Uh, the way forward uh, is uh, number one is to strengthen the existing training program for the frontline staff. Uh, we already uh, are doing the training programs, but it needs to be strengthened. As uh, Dr. Yadav also mentioned, uh, we only do five courses in a year, which is uh, which is just too little, very little. It's a drop in the ocean, and uh, we need to um, do uh, more of such uh, training programs for the frontline staff. We, uh, in order to motivate uh, the frontline staff, we need to uh, uh, design the training program at different level. That is the beginners level, the middle level, and the advanced level. For example, the zookeepers who are right, uh, who do the first training program at, as the beginners, come back on rotation again for the middle, and again come back as advanced. And these can be, uh, be uh, can be linked to uh, to their performance. Um, we need to develop a training toolkit uh, and also translate them into regional languages. Currently, we do not have a standardized toolkit for training of frontline staff in the zoos. Uh, there are a lot of good practices all around the country in the zoos, and these uh, best practices need to be collated into a guide. And uh, these pra good practices need to be uh, circulated, whether we do an, uh, a digital version of it or we do a, a hardbound uh, book. Uh, but uh, these practices need to be put together. And the other important thing is we need to have a proactive outreach program. We need to reach out to people and uh, we need to get out of the boundaries of the zoo. That is zoos beyond boundary. We need to get out of from the zoos and talk to the people and engage them um, in um, uh, in uh, in the zoos, um, in uh, communication, in uh, um, their awareness programs and uh, from which we can elicit a lot of public support for our zoos. So we, uh, uh, the Senegalese poet said, in the end, we conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we are taught. And therefore, it is very, very important for us to um, actually uh, ta um, train the frontline staff. And once they understand the, the importance, once they, they understand the importance of training, they will um, definitely, there will be a change in their attitude in their personal attitude and their competency. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, that was uh, very comprehensive and gave us some very important uh, things to look forward to, especially your uh, comments on having a training toolkit and also for the best practices guidelines, which we would be happy to work with you and others who would be happy to do that. I will request uh, all the speakers, if you can kindly be uh, with your you know, videos on, because uh, there has been a good feedback, uh, both on the YouTube and also from the registration forms. And uh, we do have time, uh, uh, another five to six minutes. So we, I will request each of the speakers to take one question. Uh, so the first question that I have is for Mr. Jamie, uh, if you are there, uh, is that, uh, how do we hack, does CPSC for that matter have specific courses for handling 
rescue animals and also for rehabilitation. And I'll add to it what was posed on the YouTube uh, channel is that do you also have specific courses for zookeepers, uh, Jamie, for you? Yeah, so so our, uh, as hopefully was clear in the talk, our, our focus is very much on building capacity for um, for planning for species conservation planning processes, um, we uh, I, I think that that our tools are definitely relevant where you have people who I think there was a question as well that was posed before around um, conflict resolution, uh, and so we we provide training for 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 topics like that. When you get into the more technical roles of um, rehabilitation. Um, Etc. Then, then your best place going to organisations like um, the Dora Wildlife Conservation Trust or um, uh, or others in in country um, to be able to to do that. So we we tend to 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 not get involved in the in the kind of the rolling up your sleeves um, it, um, um, specific zookeeper related tools um, but where those keepers and where their managers are thinking we need to work out how to develop internal plans for or collection plans or um, translocation plans or some other form of planning process or where they're looking to bring groups of people together to to make some decisions then that's where our training is particularly helpful right thank you so much uh, Jamie, we'll come back to you in case uh, there are other questions. Uh, but I would like to ask Dr. Pitapi, Madam, the question for you is that can zoos collaborate with educational institution, institutions and support and encourage them uh, to take part in sustainable conservation, especially in and around the vicinity of such colleges and schools? And can WII uh, Wildlife Institute give uh, some sort of a support? Uh, wonderful. I'm happy that um, Madam, I think we lost you. <laughs> Perhaps your video could be off and you can uh, uh, speak. Uh, the sum is issue with the bandwidth. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Madam, okay. we can hear okay. you okay. now. Uh <laughs> <laughs> okay, we um, one of the important things is reaching out. Um, that means outreach. Um, outreach means collaborating with educational institutions, uh, collaborating with uh, um, uh, groups which uh, work towards conservation um, and eliciting support. Uh, how it can be done? It can be done by facilitating dissertation work. Uh, from students, there are a lot of students who um, who look for uh, opportunities for dissertation work. Um, School of Architecture and Planning, all the architecture school students uh, have dissertation work. There are other uh, uh, students also who have uh, dissertation work, uh, and these um, uh, can be done in the zoos. Um, uh, volunteering, uh, students can be can be invited to volunteer for uh, in the zoos. Uh, I can give you an example of three students from the MS University in Baroda who came uh, to our green scale development program. It was sponsored by the Sayaji Bag um, uh, Baroda Zoo. And uh, these three college students were uh, uh, volunteer uh, for the zoo on weekends, on holidays, and uh, they come and work for the zoo. And they came for the green scale program. And after that, they they the whole concept of their volunteering changed and they now do a lot of work in the zoo. Uh, also important is to uh, for the zoo directors to go out uh, to the to the schools and colleges and talk to them on curriculum based um, uh, edu uh, subjects so there are subjects uh, on which uh, the uh, zoo directors the veterinarians um, uh, and the, and others can uh, contribute um, in the in um, and uh, contribute as presentation uh, also, uh, documentation work. Uh, students can come and volunteer for documenting certain work. 
uh, both scientific documentation as well as uh, other documentation work uh, the students can come and do. And uh, there are uh, the backyard bird count uh, is a classic example of citizen science. Uh, we uh, zoos can also undertake the citizen science program and collaborate with institutions and colleges. How can WI help? WI can actually help in skill development programs. Uh, we can uh, we can help uh, in uh, uh, preparing curriculum based uh, modules for skill development programs uh, for the colleges and uh, the institutions which are around the zoos. Uh, Thank you so much, ma'am. That was very useful, especially in terms of some very tangible green skill development program and the uh, role of universities that that is something which we are looking forward to uh, especially when we actually restart that we would be very keen to start that again uh, with you for the as and when the situation have, is uh, better uh, the third question is for uh, dr sp yadav uh, so the question which has come in is that has there been any evaluation of past trainings uh, conducted uh, so, uh, because uh, the uh, Central Zoo Authority uh, does a lot of good trainings, and but uh, is there a, any sort of a, a evaluation of that? And how do we continuously motivate and strengthen the capacities, especially of the zoo frontline, uh, towards uh, continuing with the momentum? Uh, that is what the question is. Uh, right, Sonali. In fact, uh, <clears throat> CZD has been organizing capacity building program of zoo management functionaries like <clears throat> zookeepers, biologists, educators, zoo managers, as uh, Madam Bita Pesena was telling, for several years. And for every training capacity building program, there is a, feed, a mechanism of feedback. But uh, as far as the evaluation is concerned, like after a few years, how these guys are performing, I think that we need to do. And uh, that is definitely an important aspect, but we continuously need capacity building is not one time, uh, one time job. It has to be kind of refresher work, refresher courses. Every year we must organize. In fact, uh, in my vision, in my planning, as I have discussed with uh, CJD officials, uh, we need to establish one national center of excellence for capacity building of Zoom managers. And then we also want uh, regional centers for uh, building capacity of uh, zookeepers and middle uh, management levels in the country. And uh, that is very much required. In fact, as um, Ditapi Madam has told that there is a lot of development and whatever we have done so far looks a drop in ocean. That is, that is the fact. And what was the second part of the question, Sonadi? Uh, Sir, so how do we uh, have the evaluation of the, the of the trainings that uh, CZA has conducted? Is there uh, been any evaluation has been done or not? Uh, I don't think any evaluation has been done. There is a feedback mechanism, but evaluation after a certain time, uh, of, um, I think we need to do that. And probably we need to develop some kind of methodology for evaluating uh, all, all these things. But right now, I don't think it has been done. Right, sir. I agree because what uh, Dr. Bitapi Madam had said that uh, there needs to be a standardized uh, training toolkit, uh, which perhaps uh, is one of the methods in which uh, we can have a standardized protocol for developing our capacity building initiatives. And uh, as you mentioned, that feedback is part of the evaluation, and we could do a uh, general uh, uh, discussion on that. So, uh, so with this, I think we have come to the end of this webinar. I thank all of our esteemed uh, speakers and panelists, and also the people who are watching us. Uh, that uh, this has been a great learning for us because this is, as as we have rightly said, this is part of the continuous capacity building uh, initiatives, and as part of the CESA day, we are happy to do this. Uh, I see a lot of people join, but having said that, we would really appreciate that if the zoo directors and managers who have joined today can pass it on forward and uh, give an insight to all their people uh, working in the zoos, trained or untrained, to watch these videos. I thank the team of both Mysuru Zoo 
and the CCDA bathroom uh, team, which has helped in conducting this. And thank you until we meet again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonali. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zemi. And I'm looking forward to your visit as we were discussing. We were supposed to meet in March, but <laughs> let us see. Yes. Yes. 2021. I can't okay. wait. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank All right. You. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Sonali, as well. Bye-bye.